Hi there. Let's talk about the Platinian Zero. I'm Eric Steinhardt. You can learn more about me at ericsteinhardt.com. Let's start with nothing. If we want to try to explain why there is anything at all, why is there something rather than nothing, we have to start with nothing. No things. Start with nothing. That means no God, no physical things, no quantum fields, no Big Bang, no numbers or abstract objects, no objects of any kind. If our goal is to explain why there are any things rather than no things, we can't start with any things, whatever those things might be. We have to start with nothing. There it is. Now what? What are you going to do if there isn't anything to start with? Well, let's turn to Charles Sanders Peirce, an American philosopher, 1839 to 1914. Uh, probably the greatest American philosopher who's lived so far. Well, what does he say about this situation? And Pierce begins with nothing. and We can refer to some passages in his collected writings. Uh, he says non-being only negates, but non-being has only itself to negate. And thus Peirce says that non-being negates itself. He talks about a nothing that annuls itself. And so the non-being negates itself. This is similar to what Heidegger says, das nichts nichtet, the nothing nuths, in his essay, What is Metaphysics? So by negating its own non-being, non-being makes being be. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because non-being negates itself. If you're going to start with nothing, you can't start with any things. All you got is non-being. Non-being is pure negativity. And that pure negativity negates itself. Let's represent this non-being by the tilde, the logical negation sign. I mean, what we're doing here is pure logic, right? Pure logic in the sense that it's not logic about any things. It's a logic that begins with nothing, ex nihilo. And nothing isn't a thing. It's not some kind of stuff it's not some kind of empty space. It's not a vacuum. It's not a quantum field. It's not divine absence. Nothing is not. And that negation, that is notness, right? The notness of being is symbolized logically by the tilde, the negation sign. If non-being negates itself, we can symbolize that by the self-application of the tilde to itself, and that little circular self-application of the negativity of non-being to non-being itself. Obviously, there isn't some kind of magical white til tilde floating around in some empty space. This is logical symbolism for non-being's self-negation. When non-being negates itself, boom! What happens? Non-being negates itself, so being is. But what, what does this mean? Non-being negates itself, so being is. What is there when non-being negates itself? Let's turn now to Plotinus. He talks about the one, and it looks like Plotinus starts with the one. But there are several reasons why he does not really start there. At least if he's going to be logically consistent, he can't start with the one. Why not start with the one? Well, Plotinus often talks about a kind of one before being. He says the one before being precedes existence. Since the one is the source of the existence of all beings, it cannot be any being. But Plotinus often identifies being with oneness, that is, with unity. So what comes before being comes before oneness. But zeroness is before oneness. So the one before being is some kind of zeroness. And the one before being is emptiness. Plotinus says it's precisely because there is nothing within the one that all things are from it. Now that's a strange statement. So the one before being is like the empty set. It's a kind of emptiness, but that's zero. And the one before being can only be understood negatively. Plotinus says this absolute one is none of the things of which it is the source. Its nature is that nothing can be affirmed of it. Yet only non-being is such that nothing can be affirmed of it. And non-being just is the zero. It's not the one. Zero comes before the one. And zero is a better symbol. We're only talking about symbols here. Even the one is only a symbol. We're only talking about symbols here for the non-being. The Platinian zero. Here's Dean William Inga, sometimes called the Gloomy Dean, 
uh, and he's often just known as Dean Inga because he was the dean of a cathedral. And he points out that the Platonists didn't have zero in their number system. Plotinus' one is ambiguous between the zero of non-being and the one of being, and Dean Inga argued that if Plotinus had the zero, he would have started with it. He talks about that in his uh, The Philosophy of Plotinus, second volume, pages 107 to 8. But the zero comes before the one. And we see all the time the later Roman Neoplatonists, like Iamblichus, talking about how theology has to be based on or come from arithmetic, and this is a very fine Pythagorean move. And Dean Inga points this out when saying that if they had zero, they would have started there, especially since the number zero is a nice round circle. Looks like it's got emptiness. But the zero comes before the one. So, the zero... That's what emerges as non-being negates itself. It doesn't really emerge. That just is the self-negation of non-being. No, we're using the zero as a symbol for the self-negation of non-being. So we're really using a number to symbolize something that isn't a number. We're using a number as a logical symbol. But how do we understand this? Well, let's turn to Starhawk, right? Starhawk was a pagan female writer. In her book, The Spiral Dance, she outlines her version of neo-paganism. And she says, uh, let's, well, let's take some image from Plotinus to connect up with her. The zero from Plotinus is the hidden spring from which all rivers flow. Plotinus talks about that in the Aeneids. And like the ocean, the zero is a deep abyss. It's fathomless depths of power. It's the abyss of non-being or nothingness. Now back to Starhawk. So when Starhawk presents her creation myth, she talks about the abyss of outer darkness. And the abyss is always filled with some kind of water, right? The zero is symbolized by water, or we're just using water as another symbol for non-being and the self-negation of non-being. Water often plays this role as the primal element in lots of creation myths, and we don't need to go into all those here. So we're going to use water to symbolize the zero, the self-negation of non-being. We can symbolize it like this. The zero is the abyss. We put that zero underneath a kind of horizon of being, like the ocean depths, right? There's the surface of the ocean represented by the line, and beneath it there's this abyss of non-being, right? This is a symbol, right? This is an image, a kind of platonic image. Remember, Plato talks about images in the divided line. That's where we have to start with philosophy. And we can continue here, another image. This is a somewhat traditional symbol for water, right? It's a glyph or a sigil that represents water. It's a triangle pointed downwards. I've filled it in with the color blue, kind of as a conventional image for water. So there's the zero is water. What about the one? Well, from how do we go from the zero to the one? Here's Peirce again. He says, the zero of bare possibility by evolutionary logic leapt into the unit of some quality. The zero generates the one. Non-being negates itself, and by negating itself, it makes being be. But this being is being itself, and being itself is the one. Plotinus says that over and over again, right? The one is the being of beings. It's not a particular being. It's not a being among beings, right? So the being that non-being's self-negation makes be is being itself. And non-being isn't the absence of this being or the absence of that being. It's just absence, the absence of being. And being itself is not the presence of this being or that being. It's not the presence of some beings among other beings. Being itself is just presence. It's the negation of absence. Being itself is the one. So we can symbolize this. Again, this is an image, that explosion that occurs when right, the tilde acts on itself. This explosion occurs, and in the symbolic place opened by that explosion, we find the zero and above it the one, right? And the one is symbolized there as being brought into being by the arrow, the self-negation, right? The zero inside the circle. And in fact, if we wanted to be a little more precise, we could just use that circle as the zero itself, right? But I want to stress the zero as its own symbol. And I like using that uh, circular tilde self-negation as the zero. 
So the zero, that self-negation, that circular arrow, the negative acting on the negative, non-being negating itself, brings the one into being. Now, it doesn't create the one. The one just is the self-negation of non-being, because the self-negation of non-being is the self-affirmation of being. The negative of the negative just is the positive. The zero doesn't create the one as a separate thing, because the zero isn't a thing at all, and neither is the one. Here's a nice way to symbolize it. Again, this is just an image. We have the zero, the abyss of non-being, and above it has appeared the one, right? Above the ground of being, or the one is that which crosses the ground of being and makes the ground of being be. So you can use a lot, you can go into a lot of symbolic depth and richness here. Platonism provides us with a lot of images that we need to use. We need to use these symbolic resources. So that's the story of how the self-negation of non-being generates, or is equivalent to, the self-affirmation of being, which is being itself. And this explains why there is something rather than nothing. We start with nothing, and nothing negates itself. And the self-negation of non-being is being itself. Thank you very much. I'm Eric Steinhardt. You can learn more about me at ericsteinhardt.com.